I think when you hear the word cancer, you don't really know anything about it. Like especially as a young lad, you don't expect yourself to, to kind of be in that position where you'd need to know anything about it. So obviously the worst kind of pops into your head. Yeah, it was, um, it was a difficult one to, to try and process. David, thanks ever so much for doing this. Take us back to where it all began. Where, where did you grow up? And what are your first memories of kicking a ball? I think it's probably the same as everyone else. It's, it's the Sunday league base when you get to probably five, six, and you, you realise obviously you've got an interest in football and your mum and dad probably take you just down to the local team, which was, was no different to me. I used to play for a team that was literally five minutes from my house called Wollstone Rovers. Um, and yeah, just obviously fell in love with football and, and progressed up. Very early into the Manchester City Academy, weren't you? Yeah, I think um, you can sign, uh, obviously when you're young, I think you can sign at about under nines. Um, but I think I was going prior to that, probably like under sevens, under eights, to the, the satellite camps that they, they kind of put up to see what talent's about in, in different areas and things like that. So I used to train there and then got the call up to Platte Lane, probably around under eights around that time and, and luckily yeah, signed uh, under nines. So fast forward seven, eight years and Man City let you go. Can you remember that day? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a memory that I can still remember. It was obviously devastation really. I think I'd been there for 10 years. Obviously you have it in your head that you, you're always going to be a professional football player and being at a club the size of Man City, especially when they just got the money and stuff, it did change. But in my head, I always thought I was going to continue at Man City because that's all I knew and um, when it all comes crashing down obviously it is a big reality check and I think I went on trial to Bolton straight after and they turned around because I was I was very small and just basically said they couldn't offer me any time and luckily when I went to Sheffield United I think their under 18s were struggling a little bit at the time and managed to perform a little bit and yeah thankfully they, they took a chance on me and gave me a contract. You had a brief loan spell, didn't you? Can you tell us about your uh, your professional debut? Was it Halifax Barrow? Yeah, yeah. I was, it's it's just so different. Obviously, you grow up in kind of a little perfect bubble at Man City, and then that pops, and then you go down to Sheffield United, which was a little bit of a change. But then when you go to non-league, and it's completely different, like the facilities that you get, and just everything around what they obviously can afford to do and the, the setup leading up to games, training regimes and things like that is is completely different but I loved every single second of being there. Um, I think there was me and two other players that went there so we used to carpool down and it was obviously probably the happiest moment in my football career that, at that time you know you, you're going down, you're, you're in front of a crowd, It's it means something and, and yeah like I say that was, I was just over the moon when I got the, the, the chance to go even go and chance to play but then to actually come on and I think I got one goal in probably five appearances was was obviously a real highlight for us. So then after Halifax, Sheffield United, what's it like as a teenager playing in the championship? To be honest I, I didn't really think about it too much I think I'd had one one and a half season maybe in two years of being the 19th man and and kind of traveling to, to the nice stadiums and just not being quite ready to, to play yet, even though I thought I was. Um, obviously, the gaffer kind of makes the decision. So, like I say, I was traveling to the nice stadium, just kind of itching to, to prove what I can do and, and get involved. And I thought I was training well. And, and when I finally got the call up in, in Chris Wilder's season, I, yeah, like I say, I was just kind of over the moon and didn't really think about it too much. Just wanted to go and, and play and be happy. Injuries are a part of all football life, but Christmas 2017, you had your first probably illness, I suppose, glandular fever. How how tough was that? What did that do to you? Yeah, it was a, it was a tough <laughs> tough like a little bit of an experience because I think yeah well that that was the time when I think the rumours had just started to come that a few teams a few different teams were interested in me at Sheffield United and and I had no real interest of go leaving at that time. I was I was very happy at Sheffield United and I, I love playing, um, but then. I think I had a bit of time out with glandular fever and then the rumours started to speculate that I was kind of refusing to play and stuff like that. So I got in a bit of trouble putting, I ended up in hospital on Christmas Eve and I ended up putting a story on my Instagram, which I probably shouldn't have done. I think Wilder was pretending I was fit and I put that on to, to basically 
tell the fans that I was obviously committed to the club and stuff and yeah I got in a bit of trouble with that but yeah I think um, with that time out it was it, I'd never really thought about football obviously when you're, you're not very well the, the main thought is oh, I just want to feel better and then when you feel better you just want to get back involved. So then you mentioned the rumours of, of interest in the following summer there was a lot again why did you choose Bournemouth? I think as soon as I spoke to Eddie Howe on the phone um, when the bid got accepted that I just kind of knew that I was coming to be involved in a first team in the Premier League and that was what I'd always dreamed of and yeah when the opportunity c come up and I knew I was going to be part of a Premier League first team there was there was no doubt in my mind that I wanted to take it. And how fondly do you remember your first Premier League goal? Yeah very much so I was I watched it back a few times it was yeah I think um, I'd had a few chances in the, in the games prior to that and I was a bit disappointed I hadn't scored earlier but um, I think it was, it was probably worth the wait, especially hitting the crossbar and going in made it look extra special. From that high, then comes the setback of an ankle injury that dragged and dragged. It meant you could only start eight Premier League games all at the end of that season as Bournemouth were relegated. And I mean, how hard did relegation hit you? Yeah, it was, it was a bit of a, a weird feeling. I think when I finally got back, obviously you're happy. Um, to start playing again but it was the business end of the season and we were down there so it was there was a lot of pressure on the games and it was a little bit frustrating at times because I knew what I was capable of doing say in the first season but when you've had like say eight, eight months out it's it's very difficult to, to kind of pick up where you left off and be flying and, and buzzing around the pitch and scoring goals it's a very difficult task so um, yeah it was it was a tough eight games and Obviously, I, we give everything, but it was it was just not meant to be. Then the following season, you played a fair bit, perhaps not as much as you, you'd hoped, as Bournemouth uh, got into the playoffs, but ultimately didn't get promoted. What about that next summer? How hungry and determined were you to to help this club back into the Premier League? Yeah, I think obviously it was a different kind of transitional period. Obviously, when Eddie left, it was obviously a big blow, and, and JT took over. Um, yeah, like we said, we got into the playoffs, but it wasn't meant to be. And I think I spoke to Scott uh, Parker in that, in that summer, and he was obviously telling me his plans and his ambitions of the of the next season. And I was I was really looking forward to it. I felt like the system that he wanted to play, and even in pre season, the the training and and what it was like, I, I was really on board of it. And I thought, I, well, I kind of knew that it was going to be successful at Bournemouth. And yeah, I was I was really looking forward to being a, being a part of it. So. So then we come to October 2021. When did you first realise something wasn't right? I think in, in that pre-season with Scott Parker, there was a, obviously a lot of running, like all pre-seasons, and I was just kind of lacking behind. And I'd never really experienced it. Like, I'm not the fittest one on the team, but it's not. I'd never been at the back. And that was a bit of a weird feeling. I just could not do it, and it was... It wasn't through a lack of trying, it was just my legs just couldn't kind of take me where I needed to go. And um, yeah, it, it, that was a, a frustrating period because obviously you don't really know anything's wrong at that point, but you just can't really do what you want to do. And I remember, obviously it's not his fault or anything like that, but I was having meetings with Scott Parker and um, he was showing me like the numbers from the game and I was always one of the lower ones on the end of distance covered or sprints and he was just kind of asking why and I, I didn't know why and there was no real excuse so it's, it's kind of a difficult one to kind of get your own head around why aren't you performing to the level that that you think you should be able to perform at and and I think it carried on for probably like one or two months that which was like I say a, a difficult period and Luckily, I'd, I'd been having some side effects that had been keeping me up, like night sweats, and then I had a severe um, drop of weight. I think I lost around, I think I lost about six, seven kg in probably like a week, two week span, which was obviously a lot for me. I don't really weigh that much when I'm playing properly, and obviously you're doing a lot of running. <coughs> so it was, uh, so it's probably that, and then. I went away with Wales and, and they do kind of the medical check at the start and I just kind of asked for paracetamol and just said oh, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm just struggling to sleep and things and um, 
yeah, I had that conversation with the doc and went back to my room as if kind of nothing had happened. And then I just got a knock on the door probably about 20 minutes later. And he obviously didn't want to do it in front of the lads, but every side effect that I told him had been probably highlighted as a, as a cancer uh, diagnosis, if you know what I mean. So obviously when he came into my room and obviously told me that it was like a big shock really. He, he said, obviously, I don't want to alarm you, but everything you've told us is a side effect of of cancer. It's, it's a big one to, to kind of digest. And even when he left, after saying, obviously, we'll go for tests the day after, knowing that you have to kind of ring your mum or your dad and, and tell them that when you don't know yourself or it's, yeah, it was a, it was a very tough couple of hours, probably. Imagine time stood still, didn't it? Yeah, because it's almost like you don't, you don't really believe it, I think, when he says the word, because I think when you hear the word cancer, you don't really know anything about it. Like, especially as a young lad, you don't expect yourself to, to kind of be in that position where you'd need to know anything about it unless you've had a relative that have, has kind of gone through that process. Um, so obviously the worst kind of pops into your head because as soon as you hear the word cancer, you don't really think it's a, it can be positive in any way. And you, you kind of look in at, at the bad, bad, side of it if you know what I mean so yeah it was um, it was a difficult one to, to try and process. So how do you do that how do you prepare yourself how do you stop those thoughts that you mentioned? Well, to be honest, I, I'm not really I think uh, I'm not really in touch with my emotions and stuff like that on a, on a day-to-day -day basis I'm I'm quite chilled about extreme stuff just in day-to-day -day life I don't really take any of it seriously and I think when when that comes into play it's just it's just very different I think my my dad and my girlfriend come with us to to the meeting and I, I'd already seen my dad cry prior to that and obviously my missus was quite upset at the time and like I say it is it's very difficult to to stay kind of composed in in that situation but I never really let it out until I was on my own I think I didn't really want to I didn't really want a fuss. I didn't, I didn't like anyone kind of coming to me and saying, oh, you'll be all right. And I didn't really want that conversation with anyone. So I kind of just let everyone do what they needed to do. And when I was on my own, I just kind of, obviously you have a, you have a bit of a cry and, and kind of just, just hope everything's gonna be all right. What was the prognosis when it was confirmed that it was Hodgkin lymphoma? Did they tell you, you know, what, what survival rates, treatment rates, and you know, possible return to football as well. Were you even looking that far ahead? Yeah, the, the, f the first kind of conversations we had as soon as we found out what it was, um, it, was all, it was all positive, but at the end of the day, they are all obviously medical pro professionals and they, they have a duty to, to tell you the risks and not everything is gonna be as easy as it sounds on paper, if you know what I mean, I think with Hodgkin's lymphoma and the type of treatment they've got for it, it's, I think over half, obviously have six months of chemo and then you're kind of done and you can kind of go and live your life and stuff, but there's a, there's a percentage that don't get the good news at the end of it. So you have to be prepared if, if that news comes, then you have to kind of deal with it as it, as it lies. Tell us about that treatment then, chemo. What, what does that involve? We hear, we hear the phrase chemotherapy all the time, but what were your, your daily or weekly treatment schedules? Well, for, for my specific one, it was once every two weeks I had to go in, and it usually takes around three to four hours. You have um, a drip that pumps the, the drugs in to obviously kill all the, all the cells in your body, really. Um, but like I say, there was, there was all sorts of complications with even the drip. I had to go and get um, a pick line, and so you have two tubes like dangling out your arm for six months, which obviously is a bit of an inconvenience and like just little things like that. I think eat all the side effects that they kind of warn you about at the start that don't really sound like anything. They all become problematic at some point. And uh, yeah, like I say, it was like I say, it was always positive, but it was it was a tough experience. Do you have to steal yourself going in for your next treatment of chemo? How unpleasant is it? Yeah, I think it was, it was, it was a bit misleading to start with. The first one, because your body's still technically a little bit healthy, um, 
it wasn't terrible. I thought, ah, oh, this this won't be too bad if you know what I mean. And it kind of hits home probably the second, third, and then just progressively gets worse over time. The the difficult pr bit was probably the two week span. You only start to feel a bit better probably one, two, maybe three days before your next one. So you'd have the chemotherapy on Monday. I'd feel horrendous, barely get out of bed for one week. You'd start to slowly move, but you don't feel great for the next couple of days. And then as soon as you start to feel all right and you, you can leave the house, you have to go back in and do it all over again. So it was, yeah, it was a different type of life to what I'm, I'm, I'm used to. And yeah, like I say, it was, it was tough. We often talk about fighting cancer, it being a real battle. I mean, it felt like you were fighting, did it? Yeah, I think <laughs> like my missus was used to come to me, used to come with us, sorry, on, on every single chemo, and she'd be sat there just having to kind of watch you. Like I, I just kind of I, I got to a point where I was just trying to fall asleep just so I wasn't going to be sick in the hospital, if you know what I mean. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be ill, so they kind of just put you on all the doses of the anti-sicknesses and the drowsiness pills that can kind of just put you to sleep because you can't be sick if you sleep, if you know what I mean. So that was kind of the main way I kind of tried to deal with it at the start of most weeks um, when I'd had the chemo. And like I say, you just slowly start to get a little bit better so you can kind of come off the anti-sickness a tiny bit. You mentioned your girlfriend there. I mean, she signed up to be your girlfriend, not 24-hour nurse. How, yeah. how remarkable was she during all this? Yeah, she was, she was amazing, to be honest. I think um, it's obviously a, a difficult situation and no one really wants to be involved in anything like that. And, and to be honest, I d I, when I first got the diagnosis, I didn't, even, I didn't tell her at the start because um, I didn't really want to get her upset and things like that, just in case it wasn't. So when she finally found out, she was obviously a bit annoyed that I hadn't told her first. But um, yeah, she, like I say, she was she was amazing. She drove us wherever I needed to go. She kind of looked after me. I've probably seen the worst bits about me at the minute, <laughs> um, just with all the the side effects that kind of had to go along with the chemo and stuff like that. So yeah, I can't really speak highly enough of her. And how about the, the doctors, nurses, the lab technicians, researchers? There's so many people go into this, this fight against cancer. How, how do you describe them? How do you feel towards them? It, it is a weird kind of environment when you go in because you, obviously for you, it's, it's life changing and the experience is a horrible one and it's, it's, your treatment kind of revolves around you, where as those workers, like, they see that on a daily basis and have to deal with everything. So obviously my hats go off to them to, to kind of be able to, to put up with that and, and stay strong in, in the tough times. Because like I say, my prognosis was a positive one. When you walk through the hospital, you see everyone that's kind of going through the same stuff that you are and all the nurses that have to deal with everything that's going on in, in their lives and, and yours. So it's, although it's painful going through it yourself, you only have to kind of worry about yourself, whereas, like I say, they, they have to deal with everyone. Miracle workers, aren't they? Incredible. Um, tell us about the day you got the all clear, first of all. How, I can't imagine, I don't think I've got the words how momentous that feeling must be. Can you describe it? Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a bit of a weird day, really. I think I'd woke up and we we had a meeting in the afternoon that I was I was meant to go to, to kind of find out what the the results had been, and they just kind of rang me in the morning, uh, knowing that I'd, I'd have to drive like forty minutes for the meeting, and just said we can do it on the phone if you want. So it was kind of just out of the blue, and you just find out. So it was it was very it was very nice. There was a few tears in the house from obviously the parents and and the missus and stuff. But yeah, I was, I was just over the moon really that it had worked and it was kind of all done and I didn't really have to go through it anymore. You announced it to the world on a very special day with that night, Bournemouth securing promotion to the Premier League. Before the final whistle, you were in the stands and you had a lovely ovation and then you were on the pitch for the celebrations. But what was that like being part of the squad again? 
Yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a nice feeling. I used to go and watch the games, but I didn't really feel that great. Um, but after the all clear, I'd, I think it had been like six six weeks since my last treatment, so I, I was I was feeling up okay in terms of what I had been over this past six months, but I think I, I think I celebrated for about 10-15 minutes, I had to go sit down because I was just completely out of breath, so it was a bit of a, a reality check, but it was it was obviously very nice of the fans to kind of do what they did and, and the standing ovation and then to top it off with the promotion was um, was obviously a great a great night. And then a few weeks after that you were back here as part of the squad for pre-season training, were you did you arrive with the biggest grin on your face? Yeah, I, it was it was a bit of a different one. Um, obviously, you turn up to work usually, and like I was turned up for work, but it was a bit different circumstances. I look back at, um, I think Bournemouth did a training vlog. I wasn't, you can easily go and see how much weight I had on me then um, in the first couple of weeks of pre-season. So I, I, I wasn't delusional in where I was at, and I was obviously just really enjoying even just being part of the changing room again, never mind playing in a Premier League game. So I think, yeah, just all through that pre-season, the running was a lot sweeter than what it could have been. You still had to wait a long time to be back on the pitch. You had another lovely ovation at Aston Villa, and then you, the manager brought you on, and again, a wonderful ovation. I mean, I would have been crying my eyes out on the touchline if I was coming. How did you keep it together? To be honest, I, I'm like, it is very nice and I thank all the fans for, for doing it, but I'm not really one for all of that stuff. I kind of get a little bit awkward when, when people are kind of clapping and you know it's for you and stuff like that. So it, it was very nice and I think it meant a lot that everyone kind of was was basically saying that I'd done well. Um, my mum and dad obviously loved every minute of it. They were sobbing in the crowd and stuff like that. So yeah, like I say, it was very nice, but. I always just wanted to get back on the pitch and just play football. It was never, or oh, get back for a standing ovation, if you know what I mean. So I think as soon as I was on that pitch, I just wanted to try and score a goal. It wasn't ever kind of taking in and enjoying the moment. And then you have moments like the 45 minutes in the Hampshire Senior, Senior Cup recently. Tell us about that day. <laughs> I think it was probably the world's worst hat trick, but I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah, it, again, I know where I'm at, I know what kind of my role is at this moment in time. Um, I just want to be as fit as possible to, to help the team whenever I'm called upon and, and that was just part of the process. Um, just trying to get fit and, and, and play as many games as possible is, is what the aim is now and it was, a nice, it was a nice occasion obviously to help the boys go through to the semis and yeah, it was a nice feeling. As far as the first team, you've come on against Villa and against Brighton. Is a start before the end of the season a possibility? Is that a goal, a target? Is it realistic? Uh, we'll, we'll see if we're safe first. I think, um, like I say, I, I know where I'm at at the minute and I know what I'm probably capable of in terms of Premier League standards. Um, it's a very tough league and I think when you look at the teams that we've got to play, every, every game is going to be vitally important. Um, so like I say, I just want to be in the best physical condition for me and for the team. Um, if the gaffer requires me to do anything, then I'm, I'm happy to do so. It feels horribly crass to sort of compare one survival battle to another, you know, a genuine one with a football one, but what chances do you give this club of being in the Premier League next season? I think we've got a very good chance. I think if you look at the, the league table now, um, there's, there's many teams in it that will feeling that they, they're in a relegation battle and, and we're no different. We obviously know what position we're in and what we need to do to, to kind of get out of that situation. And I think when you look at, like I say, when you look at our squad, um, I think we definitely have enough in the change rooms to, to, to be able to get out of that situation. And just finally, back to you personally, has this whole experience, this, this episode in your life, has it changed your outlook on, on things? Yeah, I would say so. I think it's probably mellowed me a little bit. I think with with everything that's gone on, you, you kind of realise that football has been my life for, I think it was 24 years before I got diagnosed, and it all meant nothing in, in probably a brief moment. So I think when you actually look at the grand scheme of things, football doesn't matter, and it's all kind of about your health and 
mentality and stuff like that and I think just being able to, to kind of even play football again is, is a real blessing. It's amazing to see you back on the field. Thank you. <laughs>